Welcome to the EKG Guy. If this is your first time, I'm glad you're joining us, and welcome back if you're returning. So in this lecture, we've been going through our EKG coding reference guide, and we've had this series going on, and now we're going to be looking at left anterior fascicular block, which is in this part five. So left anterior fascicular block, okay? And if you don't have access already, all you have to do is put this link into your search bar, enter your email address, click submit, you'll get an email, and with your email there will be a link and from the link, all you have to do is click it, and then you'll have access to the reference guide. Okay, so quite simple. Um, we've been going and making a video for every aspect of it, and we've gone through part one where we looked at the general features, the EKG, normal EKG, look at atrial abnormalities. We looked at various rhythms in part two, sinus, atrial, junctional, and ventricular. We looked at part three, the different uh, types of AV conduction delays. So you can look at that. And then in part four, we went through voltage criteria. Uh, what is low QRS voltage? What is the findings we see in hypertrophy? And what are the findings we, how do we determine ventricular access? So if you're interested and want to go back, go listen to those. So now we're in this part uh, five here, and we'll be looking at left anterior fascicular block. Now, if you're interested in more of our uh, EKG courses and uh, lectures, in books, you can go to ekg.md, okay, and there you can click on the course and you can see all the different uh, books and resources we have available. All right, so let's get started. So left anterior fascicular block, so what's going on here? Well, essentially what you are looking for is left axis deviation, okay, and if you recall, left axis deviation, and in this case between negative 45 and negative 90 degrees. So if you look here, here's zero degrees, this is positive 90 degrees, this is plus or minus 180 degrees, and then this is a negative 90 degrees, okay, we're saying it's between negative 45 and negative 90, so between this point here and this, okay, so that would be that, this is negative 45 degrees, and that that's what puts us into that uh, left uh, anterior fascicular block location, okay. Now, it's not only that, but that's the main thing, okay? So let's look at why this comes about. So just to review our conduction system, here's our sinus node up here, okay? From our sinus node, we have the AV node. Those are both in our right atrium. So this is our right atrium. This is our left atrium. This would be the right ventricle and left ventricle, okay? So we have our sinus node to our AV node, the His bundle, and then we have a right bundle branch that supplies this right ventricle. And then we have the left bundle branch that innervates uh, both the left ventricle, okay? And the left ventricle has both an anterior and posterior fascicle that come off that left bundle branch, okay? And in this case, as you can imagine, just like with the other blocks, we have the left anterior fascicle blocked, okay? So imagine that conduction comes down fine here, goes down to the right uh, ventricle as well, all right? And then comes here, but then meets a delay, okay? And that fascicle is blocked. And as a result, it really relies on the left posterior fascicle depolarizing that left ventricle, okay? So imagine this here being your left posterior fascicle, okay? So left anterior fascicular block, or you may have heard it as left anterior hemiblock, is an anatomical or functional dysfunction in that left anterior fascicle. As a result, the left ventricle depolarization relies on the left posterior fascicle to do so. Remember, left anterior fascicle, this is a thin organized fibers innervating the anterolateral lateral left ventricle. Okay, and as we said, the conduction, so let's just erase this here, the conduction will come down, all right, and then it will depolarize the right ventricle, okay, such that you have a vector one that's depolarizing this way. It'll meet that block there in the left posterior fascicle and rely on the second vector to depolarize the rest of it by the left posterior fascicle, okay? So how does that appear on the EKG? Well, we know that we have inferior leads down here, so two, three, AVF, Okay, and then you have one and AVL over here. Here's one and AVL, okay? So if that first vector is going towards these inferior leads, you should see an upward deflection. So imagine we have two, three, and AVF. That first vector is going towards it, so it'll have an up deflection. But the second and more dominant vector is going to have a negative deflection as it goes away from those leads, okay? You may see something like that. 
Now with leads 1 and AVL, the lateral uh, limb leads, you can see that the first vector is going away, so you'll have a negative deflection at first, okay? And then it's going towards those leads over here, the second vector, and as a result, it'll be a positive upstroke. Okay, so that's where you see you see these RS complexes in the inferior leads and the QR complexes in one and AVL. Okay, now if you look here, you can see that we have these. Here's one, here's AVL, and you can see the Q wave and then this big R wave. Here's the R wave and the Q wave. In this one, you have the Q R and then a small s, okay? But the, the main thing that we'll find out is that this axis deviation is what causes, is what we're looking for. And then in the inferior leads, which are these ones, two, three, AVF, we're looking at this RS complex, RS, okay? You can see them here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So typically there's the QR complexes in one AVL and the RS complexes in the inferior leads. Now the QR pattern in AVL okay may have a 45 millisecond delay from beginning uh, of the qrs complex to the peak of that r wave so what does that mean well if you imagine you have your qr complex it's saying from the beginning here to the peak is greater than 45 milliseconds okay and if you were to look closely you would see it in this case here it certainly is okay remember one small box is 40 milliseconds okay so just above that so hopefully that makes sense now let's look at the axis here okay we won't go over how to find it in detail as we do that in other lectures okay and you can go back and listen to those but let's just take a look at what the axis is here Okay, and we said we're looking for that uh, leftward axis, okay, in the range over here of between negative 45 and uh, negative 90. Remember, lead 1 is here, the positive end. Lead AVF is here, it's positive end. Here's lead 1, mostly positive, so going towards the positive end of lead 1. And then if you look at AVF, these complex here are mostly negative, so here's the positive end of AVF. We're going to go away from it, okay, towards that. And then we use another lead. Remember, lead 2 sits here, okay? And you know that exactly perpendicular to lead 2, the positive end, is this here, negative 30 degrees, okay? So in general, if it stays on, if lead 2 is negative, it'll be in this region here. If it's positive, it'll be over here, okay? So if you look at lead 2, Lead 2 is clearly negative, okay, and it's going to put us over in this region here, okay. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at lead 3, lead 3 sits here. This is clearly negative, pushing it in this direction as well. Now, the axis in this was actually negative 60 degrees uh, from the machine, so you can see it's within that range, okay. So the main thing you're pretty much looking for in these is left axis deviation, is the key one, okay, between negative 45 and negative 90. Now those between negative 30 and negative 45 degrees, some will call this probable left anterior fascicular block, okay? So uh, just so you're aware. Now in one and AVL, so one and AVL, remember you're looking at those QR complexes, and then in the inferior leads, two, three, and AVF, we have those RS complexes, okay? So pretty much the opposite of them. The QRS interval tends to be uh, within normal limits, okay? It may be slightly prolonged, but in general, you can see that the QRS complex here is uh, quite normal. Uh, in fact, it was. We talked about the R wave peak time could be more than 45 milliseconds in lead AVL, okay? Uh, and uh, you may note that this may mimic an anteroseptal MI or mask an inferior MI, okay? So make sure you keep that in mind. So what causes this? Well, this can be seen actually in healthy individuals, but it's most significant when someone has um, heart disease, okay? If they have hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary artery disease can cause it. If someone has a heart attack that affects uh, the blood supply to that fascicle, the anterior fascicle, you can have that. Uh, patients with dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you may have degenerative disease of the conduction system. Myocarditis can cause it, amyloidosis, and hyperkalemia. So, this is more common than the left posterior fascicle uh, fascicular block, okay? And 
Why is that? Well, it's due to a smaller arterial supply and thin bundle fibers of the anterior fascicle. Okay. Now, isolated left anterior fascicular block is often considered benign, but in some cases it may actually progress to bifascicular block, in which we have a left anterior fascicular block and a right bundle branch block or even complete uh, heart block. Okay. So again, the main criteria that you wanted to keep in mind are the left axis deviation, Okay, we said in that range, negative 45 to negative 90 degrees. Okay, we talked about the one in AVL and the inferior leads. In one in AVL, you'll see the QR complexes. In two, three in AVF, the inferior leads, the RS complexes. It's mainly this left hand axis deviation that you're looking for. Okay, uh, the other thing to keep in mind um, is that this criteria does not apply in those with congenital heart disease in which left axis deviation is present in infancy. Okay, so hopefully uh, you'll keep that in mind in your patients. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100 more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay? And then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide. Uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay, and these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there, okay. We'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use, uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay? You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay? And you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level, with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself um, 
25% off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.